I, I am by no means <coughs> an expert on Lord Reading's senatorial board or Lord Reading. Uh, my approach of what I've done today is that of a social historian, a teacher over at Merrimack College. I was drawn to the whole project of doing something on the senatorial uh, because of the relationship to public health issues in the state of Massachusetts and the role Massachusetts had. It uh, was one of the first in many areas and one of the leaders in dealing with the, <coughs> the problem of tuberculosis. And forget about it now. It's amazing now when we talk to people and find how many people were affected, their families affected by tuberculosis. I'm astounded at it that because our perspective today is that it's not a serious health care problem. Uh, but in the 19th century, it was the biggest killer of people. It accounted for about half of all deaths. And not just in the United States, but in the entire world. <coughs> uh, we, we've got that distance from it today. But in its time and place, there's a tremendous necessity for uh, trying to confront the problems and become a big public health issue in the United States and the world. Um, ultimately, uh, I'm using the term Martin's work because initially the sanitarium was referred to as Martin's work. And it, it shows up in much of the literature uh, about tuberculosis and tuberculosis. Uh, and then I thought, if nothing else, it would get somebody to say, who the heck, I mean, what the heck are they talking about? And it might elicit some interest because I gather that was not a popular you know, uh, designation for the hospital locally, but initially that was the name that was given, and you'll see that name in some of the drawings I'm about to use. When the uh, sanatorium was built, it was built in 1909, or built in 08, opened to the public in 1909. It was one of four dedicated sanitaria in the, the state of Massachusetts specializing in tuberculosis treatment, though there were other treatment centers in Massachusetts. It was one of the 30 uh, public institutions in the state of Massachusetts that provided for uh, physical, mental health, uh, in a, a vast network of state-run facilities uh, that were constructed between 1830 and 1930. And of course, now there are so few of them left. And, uh, and, and we have somebody here today from the agency that works on uh, on these now abandoned properties, or at least not functioning properties anymore. Uh, the, um, I wanted to go into a little bit, because my perspective is rather broad. You know, why these hospitals? How did we deal with tuberculosis? And then what has happened over time in terms of the, the functioning of, of facilities like uh, the sanitarium in, uh, in North Reading? Uh, and so I just thought I'd take it to that larger picture of Massachusetts and how they dealt with public health issues. Uh, Confronting the issue of public safety and public needs uh, began back in the colony of Massachusetts and goes back to the poor law of 1692, so it goes way back, though very little was done in the early years. And when they used the term poor, it was an umbrella term. It meant the ill, it meant widows, it would mean uh, abandoned children, orphaned children, uh, it would mean the mentally ill, physically ill, people who did not have somebody to take care of them. So it was a very generic term uh, when they used that expression uh, for uh, the, what we're more familiar with when we talk about uh, the care of the poor in New England in particular was the institution of the poor house or the poor farm. And most communities in Massachusetts would have had a poor house or a poor, poor farm. Uh, that went back to the responsibility of the local communities to deal with that generic group of people that they designated as poor. Um, uh, and one of the most interesting things about this whole concept of, of the public duty to care for those who could not care for themselves um, goes back to the post-revolution period when the country was starting 
and they would designate between the settled and the unsettled poor. The unsettled poor, people who had no legal ties to a community, but were resident in the community, they were sent out of the community. So in the, back in the 1690s, I mean 1690s, the 1790s, in the early era of independence, you'd see all these legal actions taken in Massachusetts to expel people from a community if they could not prove that they had legal or family ties to the community. And they were literally taken by the local sheriff, brought to the edge of town, and told to go into the next town. <laughs> then you had the settled poor, who were people who had rights to care within their community. Some were cared outside, meaning that they could stay, they had homes and that there were people to help them, but they might not have had medical care available to them. So, you know, the cost of getting the doctor, or they might not have the ability to heat, uh, to get coal or wood for their fires during the winter. And so the community would give them so much money, in, you know, in order to get those services or the needs fulfilled. People who had no homes of their own, who didn't have extended family, were kept in-house care, and those were poor house or poor farm. And initially, uh, North Reading had the poor house, but it was not large enough to deal with the needs of the community, and eventually a larger place with agricultural land uh, was uh, established. And it ran from 19, 1805 to 1930, so for quite a long time. But by 1930, there was only one person there. But these poor houses or poor farms would have taken in a broad group of people. So you would have had orphan children, you would have had widows, you would have had mentally ill, you might have had uh, unmarried women who were pregnant. It, it was a whole hodgepodge. When I looked into the uh, poor house in uh, Newburyport, a lot of sailors that got off ships and were sick. They had to be cared for somewhere, and they didn't have family in the area, so they ended up in the poor house or the poor farm in Newburyport. But, but it was the catch-all institution when there were no public facilities or private facilities uh, for that matter. Massachusetts attempted to start some type of public and private facilities. New York and Pennsylvania had had general hospitals early on. Uh, but Massachusetts had nothing, and in 1811, private subscriptions were taken up to establish uh, Mass General, the General Hospital. But that was pretty much a private institution. And Josiah Quincy, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives in Massachusetts, in 1821, wanted a, a that, I'm, not, I, I'm starting to use the term vast, but he wanted some action on the part of the state to provide, particularly for health care and for other uh, necessities in the state, particularly because between 1800 and 1820, the percentage of unsettled poor, meaning people who had no official ties to any community in Massachusetts and who were being bounced around, that population exploded 500% in 20 years. And so they realized the state had to now come in somehow because the communities were all shuffling everybody off to the next community. And they, they needed, he felt morally, uh, to do something about it. So he had called for a network of institutions that the state would pay for, but it was slow in, in coming. And it really took until the 1840s and 1850s uh, where some facilities for the blind, for orphan children, for juvenile delinquents, the mentally ill, then bit by bit the institutions began to uh, be developed. And in the 1850s, the state poor houses or the alms houses like um, Tewksbury State Hospital was established. Um, and, um, the, you know, and then the system from that point on would gradually expand until by the early 1900s there were well over uh, 30 uh, the state uh, run facilities in the state of Massachusetts serving all sorts of, of needs. Uh, the, it's Tewksbury. And I was, I've always heard that, you know, one of the most famous people that was um, 
uh, that lived at Cookstead State Hospital early on was Ann Sullivan, a teacher of Helen Keller. And she was there because her mother had died of tuberculosis. And the father had abandoned the children afterwards. And so she and her little brother had been there. And then she had become blind because of trachoma. And then she pretty much begged some commissioners who were touring the facility in Tewksbury uh, to get uh, schooling at the Perkins School. And, and they made the arrangements and got her in there. And of course, that, that made the rest of her life. Uh, but she had very little up until that time and no education until they finally sent her to the Perkins School. Tuberculosis was the single worst scourge of the world, as I said already. Um, and it was only gradually that people began to realize how it, it could be addressed. The first problem was to understand what it was. Um, and, and particularly because of the fact not only was it the single largest killer in the world, and in, in, uh, in the United States as well, but it struck people between the ages of 15 and 42. And so it was during the years of one's highest productivity that you were losing a segment of the population. It struck people at all age levels, but it, it really um, was worse on that middle group of people who were really in the most active years of their lives, and therefore it, it, it had a tremendous effect, uh, and potentially on countries, on their economy, on their society. Uh, it's only after the Civil War that Pasteur in, in France and Koch in Germany began to understand more about what tuberculosis was. Uh, Koch was able to prove by the 1870s it was not inherited. So initially it was thought to be something that you were born into. And then he was able to prove no, it was a disease you contracted, that it was something spread in the air through coughing, through the fluids that came from one's lungs or the mouth. Um, but even he didn't realize initially that it was also spread by cows. They thought that bovine TB and human TB were separate, but one of the biggest reasons why people were getting TB was because of milk and the, uh, the drinking of the milk of infected cows. And then Pasteur realized that, and then pasteurization began to kill off the, 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 the TB bacillus in, in the cows. And then finally realized that that was also a problem. Um, the other problem was treatment. Nobody really knew. You know, before the A, before World War II, and before antibiotics, it was very difficult to, to treat anything that had a bacteria. Um, and so it took a long time to, to try to find some way to mitigate the effects of the disease. Uh, one of the uh, earliest uh, bright ideas that anybody had, the person who ran the mammoth caves in Kentucky thought that the air, pure air within the mammoth caves would be great for people with tuberculosis. And so he started a clinic in one of the caves. In one year, everybody treated was dead. Um, you know, it, that wasn't the answer. And, and for the most part, the understanding before having anything you know, specific to treat TB with was that you needed fresh air. And so this is a very famous photograph uh, from the um, Jacob Reese book, How the Other Half Lives in New York, showing a woman who has TB isolating herself, living up on the roof of her tenement building in a tent year round to try to you know, get the fresh air that was required. There were some clinics uh, and this shows some, uh, one of the clinics in, in New York. Uh, but they, it, it was very difficult to, you know, that's why they had campaigns about not publicly, excuse me, not publicly spitting, uh, because that was one of the ways that tuberculosis was, was being spread. Uh, whoops. In New York, they started some of the first private sanatoria back in 1885, more on the idea of the spa, and so obviously these had to be wealthy clients. These were not public facilities by any means. Um, and, and so the problem for the vast majority of people remained. Massachusetts uh, began to establish wards for tuberculosis, isolation wards, in the existing hospitals. So Tewksbury, Danvers, Worcester, they had separate wards. 
But then finally in 1895, Massachusetts established the first public sanatorium for the treatment of tuberculosis in the United States, and that was at Rockland. Um, this problem uh, did not stop uh, in Massachusetts, and so eventually, and especially with a lot of the work of progressive writers, you know, the muckrakers of the early 1900s, uh, they really exposed some of the dangers and, and pressing that this was a public emergency. Something had to be done about tuberculosis. And so Massachusetts then eventually responded in the early 1900s to build three more exclusive you know, facilities exclusively for the treatment of tuberculosis. And Reading would be one of them. Uh, here's the, the existing, the older facility in Rutland. They had these outdoor platforms where people would sleep, you know, in order to get the fresh air. Uh, then there was one in Westfield, and then Lakeville in Muddleboro. Uh, they were all opened all around the same time, around 1909. And this shows one of the administration buildings early on uh, in North Reading. This was, the site was a very large site, but it's very similar to all of the state hospitals that were established in the sanatorium. They all were expected to be up on a high area of land, you know, with some type of perspective, some fresh water nearby, uh, some land that could be farmed, could be worked for the support uh, of the, and the activities of the people. Uh, that were going to be treated there, and it's a big, you know, 87 acre lot, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And I'd only gone to it the first time, and of course, after all, the apartments were constructed, oh. so I never got the sense of it. You see a few of those pathetic pine trees left, but that was one of the most uh, stunning uh, characteristics of the site were all the, the pine trees that existed there, and, and tall, you know, pine trees that were there. When it was opened, the very first director in North Reading was a doctor who was brought in from Tewksbury. So he'd been working at Tewksbury already in the tubercular ward. And it's Dr. Emerson. He was brought to North Reading. He stayed in North Reading for a couple of years and then went off to Rutland. And he was the director in Rutland for many years uh, into the 1940s. Um, the, the whole site eventually had 23 major structures uh, on the property. And to just give you an idea of why these institutions, the sanatorium, were so important, just compare how much it cost. At North Reading, it, and there was a directory produced in 1911 and another one in 1916 that listed all the facilities in the United States and told you how much they cost and what kind of patients they would take. Um, at, uh, let's say at that time you would have an average early wage, uh, average weekly wage of between, you know, nine, ten dollars a week, the average man uh, working. Um, in order to be treated in New York, at Saranac, you paid anywhere between seventeen and forty-four dollars a week. Okay? And in North Reading, four dollars a week. And if you could not afford it, your community would pay the cost, or the state, if your community uh, could not pay the, the cost. So you knew that there, in order for normal working people to be able to get treatment, otherwise the facilities in New York are really only for the wealthy. You know, more than four times the average weekly earnings uh, of a person. Uh, you know, and, and you calculate, compare it to today, and you can realize how um, backbreaking that, that kind of cost was uh, for people at the time. And I, I have a few of these um, images that I wanted to use, and, 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 and some quotes. And you'll see on you know, the back table. Uh, there's a reproduction of the photocopy of the manual for patients in North Reading. So no matter where you were, and including North Reading, the, the treatment was going to be fresh air. But in, in the early 1900s, there were organizations in Paris and in the United States that were studying tuberculosis and printing all these uh, plans 
you know, for the, the perfect kind of hospital. And North Reading often appeared in the 1911, the 1916 publications. So I wanted to juxtapose that with a, a couple of the quotes about fresh air um, dealing with North Reading. So on, on this one, so the suggestions for the patients at North Reading. And this shows one of the premier buildings in North Reading, totally open. It's a lean-to, wooden lean-to structure. I believe those are the buildings that then later were enclosed and no longer open to the air that, that Joan has some wonderful photographs of. Uh, but in the booklet for treatment, uh, suggestions for the patients of the North, North Reading State Sanatorium, uh, treatment in the open air can and should be taken in all kinds of weather, provided you protect yourself against rain or too strong winds. <laughs> never stay out. Never stay out if you are chilly. Come in for a while, and when you are warm, go out again. You can generally harden yourself against cold by remaining in it. You know, by all means. <laughs> and, and, and you're going to see on that map of the site of the hospital from the 1930s. You're going to see these buildings. So originally, these were all open to the air with canvas used as a temporary wall. And then eventually, they seem to have been boxed in uh, by the 1930s, you know, 1940s. I believe they had all been uh, boxed in. Uh, so you just had to get tough. The fresh air will stimulate. And this, these are those buildings opened up with the awnings sometimes closed, sometimes rolled up. So this is North Reading. And originally, it treated all age groups. And then eventually, it, it concentrated on children. But here you go again. The fresh air will stimulate digestion, aid assimilation, and tone up the various organs of the body. Do not be afraid of the cold weather. Or <laughs> wrap warmly. <laughs> Wrap warmly when out of doors and always have an extra wrap handy. The results attained will be in proportion to your own efforts. I love it. If you, if, you have to do it. You're the only one that can make you better in, in order to do that. And it makes me think about the logic of that woman living up on the roof of the tenement building, right? That was what people were saying. That's how you were to get better by being you know, staying out in the cold. And this is an aerial um, view. Obviously, most of the buildings, the wooden, the older wooden buildings had been uh, taken down. So this is, I believe, shortly before the demolition that this aerial was, ta uh, was taken. And you see, you know, how heavily wooded it was. What a difference, especially when you go to the site now. It's rather shocking. Um, by the 1920s, uh, there were over 200 uh, patients, but 1920, they ranged in age. You had people from 1 to 65, you know, until 1926 when they, when they began to concentrate on the care of, the, uh, of children. Um, the, the, and I would, was able to put together some detail about who was there because the <laughs> census was taken. So 1920, 1930, 1940, you could see who was working there and living there, what jobs they did. You could always also see in 1920 all the adult patients, where they came from, uh, what they did for a living. And so it was a, it's a wonderful little capsule view of who was being treated and, and the tremendous variety of the situations and the jobs that people had. It was very interesting. When they started exclusively dealing with children, then you lost that snapshot because then they wouldn't list the children individually. I think only children who did not have other homes, you know. So if a, if a child was the ward of the state, their name was listed as residents, as permanent residents. But uh, otherwise, you, you don't get to see that. But what you do get to see is the size of the staff. Uh, 1920, 52 staff members including the medical and the kitchen staff and, and the like. And by 1930, uh, they had 170, 107 employees. So it was a big employer in the area. And then it, it was even more by 1940. 
And then, of course, we don't have access to the, 18, uh, the 1950 uh, census, so I'm, I'm not sure. But it really was a major institution and a source of employment in the area. Uh, in 1962, the control of the sanitarium uh, transferred to the Department of Mental Health in the state of Massachusetts, and they closed the facility for the treatment of TB. But really, dealing with TB wasn't over, even at that point. After World War II, you had the antibiotics and you had BCG treatment that generally got used in the United States. Finally, it had been used in France beforehand, but it was only after World War II that it was uh, used here. But then I was doing, I, I don't know if any of you have been watching the First Lady series on C-SPAN. It's a wonderful series in the lap. I had just been watching the episode on Eleanor Roosevelt. She died in 62 from tuberculosis. Yes, and it, it, it played no favorites whatsoever. And she was sick for two years before the doctors ever diagnosed it properly. She had been miserable trying to deal with it. So, 62, this institution, and I'm sure many of, of the other places, because we're starting to get control of the disease very quickly from the 1950s on, and so more than likely it would have uh, appeared to be uh, unnecessary under the circumstances. And of course then, in, after 62, it, it became the J.T. Berry uh, Rehabilitation Center for the Developmentally uh, Disabled. That was then closed in uh, 95, and then much of the land was uh, left abandoned. The state still has one treatment center for tuberculosis, the Shattuck Hospital. It still has a, a unit for tuberculosis. But it's nothing, uh, in terms of the problem in the state, is nothing compared to what it had been at one time. 2012, uh, 215 cases in the state of Massachusetts. And there are dozens of uh, clinics around the state. Uh, but just the Shattuck operates a unit. And the highest percentage uh, of TB in the state is in Middlesex County. So 30% of the TB cases are uh, still in, in Middlesex, which I found uh, a little surprising. And of course, then in uh, 2011, the demolition occurred, and then the development for over 400 units of housing. But we also have the privilege tonight of a, another perspective on all of this. And Joan Pinelli is here. And she allowed me to digitize some of the photographs she took when she was a patient at the hospital. And so we, we put some together, and she was going to comment on them. And perhaps it might give some of the rest of you who have material uh, about it, it, you know, it'd be nice to uh, try to memorialize it, digitize it, do something with it uh, to make sure that this part of the local history is lost. So Joan, and I can mm -hmm. just sit near this and use it when you want. Maybe you could tell people the details and who that lovely creature is on the right. Uh, well, I think that's the sign going into the, the, into the hospital. It just says Dr. Bering State Sanitary. And I was glad I took that picture. It's kind of like an introduction to, to what it was all about. And, uh, was that on Route 62? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, sure. Well, do they know who that young well, lady is? You <laughs> <laughs> have to make sure about that. This was in front of the first building. Um, when you first went to the hospital, they called it a hospital, uh, you were in quarantine until they found out what exactly, where they were going to put you. So this was a view from my window at the hospital park. And we used to play croquet out there when, when we were able to have any kind of activity. That was like a little croquet area. That's what we played out there. And so these are some of my, my friends that uh, Girl Sandy, she on the left. She was there with her sister. There were a lot of brothers and sisters. There were, there were a lot of foster children. Uh, they didn't really have any. I don't know where they left, went when they left, but there were foster children there. That was on St. Patrick's Day little thing we had up at the top there. We, we, we did a lot of things. We did a. They had 
you know, things for Easter and things for Christmas. And we had movies and we played games and we had activities. When you went down camp, this is what the camp area looked like where that wooden building is. Um, before that, after you left the hospital park, you went to either, either of two wards. One, you were negative, meaning you weren't contagious, and one, you were positive, which you were contagious. So you had to wait from the positive wing, you had to wait to move that, really getting better to go into the negative wing. And then the next step was to be down camp. Everybody wanted to be down camp because you had all kinds of activities. There were really no, no restrictions or anything. You just waited until you were well enough to go home. You had to have three negative masters before they were ready to go home. Now, I was there in um, May 24th, 1951. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a ward about a month later. And then I went down camp in, in December. And then I wrote, I wrote down that they had, you had like a group two that meant certain activities that they gave you. And then you had full activity, which meant that you could just do anything. You could you know, walk around and you didn't have any really restrictions. Unfortunately, I went back. I went home, and six months later, I came back. How old were you? And did you attend school? Oh yes, oh yes. I kept a diary for four years. Oh, and it's amazing because I hadn't read it for so long and I've been going through it and it's like all of these memories, you know, came back to me, you know. But um, <coughs> I think we were talking about people being children being there and having like traumatic experiences. I read this diary and it's it's really happy. I mean I was a very lonely child. And my mother had TV. She died. Her sister had TV and died. And um, when I was five, my mother was in Rutland. And my father would take me there. And there were no visitors. Children were not supposed to visit because everybody was really contagious. But some of the parents, including my father, would boost us up over the porch to visit with my mother and my and she'd be there smoking a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> it was just amazing. And this went on for a long time. And uh, at that time, um, I'm an only child. Uh, I believe my father really didn't have anyone to take care of me. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Madonna in East Washington, you know, with the, the Madonna, the big statue of the Madonna. Sure. Well, next to the statue, the statue wasn't there then, but next to that, it was a building where the nuns used to live. Um, but they made it into, I called it an orphanage. It probably wasn't an orphanage. But I would stay there five days a week with these nuns. I was five years old. And on Saturday, my father would pick me up and he'd keep me until Sunday and bring me back. And I go there once in a while and the iron gates are still there. And I can remember holding on to the gate, holding on to my father's leg and begging him you know, not, not to leave me there. But I believe that's, I was there until my mother came home. And then she was well for a while. And we spent a lot of time in Maine. She was from Maine, so I used to go there every summer. We'd go to Maine, and it was, it was fine. Mm -hmm. And then she got really, really sick. And she was home. We had a very small apartment in East Boston, and uh, I wasn't allowed in her bedroom. And my father worked nights, so I was always alone. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I had to walk through her bedroom. We couldn't sit on the bed. We couldn't go near her or anything. Like we couldn't even use the bathroom sink because sometimes that's what she used to use to spit in, like you know, mm -hmm. all the phlegm or whatever, the coughing. So um, I did. I I had a, a very lonely life. And but when I went to the hospital in Mount Reading, everybody had a lonely life there, and everybody had a mother or a father or an aunt, someone who had TB and had affected their life. And um, we formed a lot of friendships. And uh, I was talking to someone yesterday. I wanted her to come today, but she, she couldn't make it. We were together. We, we kept this friendship going for a long time. And I went to call her now. She wants to know how, how it goes. But I. I have a story I'm going to read you because 
this explains how lonely it was. I'm in a writing group, and this was just a little story. I had written this story before, and um, the instructor at my writing group, it's a memoir group, told me to change it and write it to somebody. Instead of just writing the story, write it to somebody. So I wrote the story to my mother. And it's just short, but I'll give you an idea of where I was in going to this hospital. And then a lot of my friends had similar, similar stories. The name of the story is called The Dollhouse. And I'm writing it to my mother. And it just says, most of my memories of you are of you in your room in bed. You were sick, always sick. I would come home from school and you were in bed where you were where, where I left, when I left. I was 10 years old, your only child, and so lonely. I knew when I was walking home from school that that's, what, how, I, that's how I would find you. I was okay with that because I had my dollhouse. It was white with red shutters and real glass windows, real curtains and rugs and bedspreads. It had our address on the door. I'd come, I'd come home and change my clothes and couldn't wait for my house to become real. I wasn't lonely anymore because I had little doll figures that came, that came alive. The mother was in the kitchen baking cookies for her children for when her children came home from school. The father was home from work and the dog had a, a brother to play with. All the rooms were neat and clean, and everyone talked to everyone. I would play all afternoon, not even noticing that it got dark. I would put on the lights, but I don't have any memories of you cooking. I must have eaten something. Pop, I called my father Pop. Pop didn't come home from work until after 10, so I was alone again. I wasn't allowed in your room because of your illness, and there was no TV, so mostly I read. I knew you had been a nurse years before, so I would read some of your medical books. This was my life every day until the day I came home from school and my dollhouse was gone. I went screaming to the door of your room, wanting to know where did it go. Your answer was that I was too old to play with the dollhouse and that you had given it to your friend for his dog. Oh. I still think of this after all of these years. We could never understand how you could how you could not have known how much that house meant to me. And I remember seeing it in, his, in your friend's yard, the insides torn apart and the dog never even went in it. It wasn't long after that that you were taken from me. Now you were really sick. You went to a sanitarium in Rutland. The day, <clears throat> the day you left, I went to school, as usual. I could see the back of our house from the schoolyard, separated by a black iron fence, another iron fence. <laughs> I thought I saw the ambulance in front of the house. I don't remember where I went after school that day, maybe to Nana's house. But I know that if I had had my dollhouse, I would have been okay because I would have moved in there with the mother in the kitchen making dinner, a real brother and a father, and all of us at the dinner table. I never saw you again after that day. That was the last time I saw you. But uh, that dollhouse was like my whole life. I, I, I can't even explain to you how important it was to me, you know. And uh, after that, when I met my husband, who I'm married to now, the first thing he gave me was a dog. <laughs> but um, and I just wanted to say, like, about the foster children, about the loneliness and friendships. We had, we, we, had, there weren't any really nurses. We called them nurses. They really weren't real nurses. They were maybe aides or whatever. And we had a couple of night, night ones that would come on at three o'clock. It was so nice. And we would give them money, and they would go buy us sandwiches at Kitty's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like a big, big treat to get something. Like that, right? And the other thing is, I was a big, big baseball fan. Unfortunately, it was the Yankees. <laughs> and I, I, I have a diary here, and I have every single score of every single game <laughs> ever <laughs> in the year, really. I mean, I even knew, like, uh, Mickey Mantle his birthday, October 20th. <laughs> and, uh, I really followed baseball. 
But when I was in the beginning, when I'm in that quarantine part, they, you could not get out of bed. It was strict, strict bed rest. It was only one television. It was like in the corridor. And they would wheel my bed to the door. I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, it's so that I could watch the game. You know? <laughs> and they told us we couldn't go in the sun. We couldn't wake our arms up because I did something to your lungs. You know, I mean, they had all of these really strange things. And you're even ask me about the heat when we were down camp. My girlfriend that I spoke to yesterday, I was talking to her about the heat. And she said to me, don't you remember they used to heat the bricks and put them at the foot of the bed? <laughs> that was our heat. There was no heat at night. Well, you know, because I was thinking about these buildings. These yeah, were the buildings, that's the buildings that were wide open when they were right. first constructed uh, because they had canvas. Mm -hmm. And so then that's just a, a wall that was added in uh, they had a hurricane in uh, August 31st, 1954, and I was, we were there. I mean, we were down at the very end there, and they were really worried about the place really falling apart. It was really, really, really bad. What are these buildings? They have the like, half timber and work. That's, where, that's when we walked to the dining room. It was a dining, because we didn't eat down, down here. We went to the dining room, and that, uh, that's what that was. That building on the right was the dining room. Yeah. And uh, oh, the other thing is, we got weighed every week. Every week, I have every 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 page. Every week, it's like a game of words. Half a pound. You had they wanted you fat. They wanted you big. And whatever. You know, they felt that that was healthy. <laughs> but we we kept busy. We went to movies. We played games. We had a lot of activities. We formed a, a lot of uh, a lot of friendships. And, you know, I mean, mostly we were happy there. I mean, I don't remember. You know, the initial thing of getting me, I was, it must have been sad. You know, and then when I went home and then had to go back again, that was that was devastating. You know, mm -hmm. my mother died while I was there. I came home for a good job, for a good job. And, uh, I don't know if anyone has questions about anything. Do you want to look at the staff? I can show that. Well, yeah. <coughs> yeah. That was Miss Grant, and the, the back of that the middle picture I have down R N. She was a she was a real nurse. <laughs> 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 real nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Were there a number of doctors there, or was oh, there, God, there was, was a handful? There was a handful of doctors. I don't know, maybe five or six. Mm -hmm. I remember Doctor Cam. Do you? Oh wow. I had Dr. Georgiantis. Do you remember him? He was no, great. My, my father worked. Oh, he worked? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, um, but Dr. Karen was, a, my father was a bacteriologist. Okay. Um, Al Sylvia. And, um, <laughs> we, but Dr. Karen was, was his friend. So mm -hmm. He was like, uh, you know, that's how we, who we'd go to. Really? You know. Uh-huh. He was sick, or he needed a shot or something. Yeah. Well, did he have a practice other than being at the hospital? Like, he must have had a, a practice, a local practice. Well, I don't know did that. You, I think just he was just maybe as a, oh no, was that the hospital? Oh, at the hospital. Oh, okay. you know, I lived on the ground. Oh, I saw him. Uh, behind, I, I assume we went to school in the, in the, the school? brick building. The brick building. The school well, house. right behind that was a little wooden house that's right there. Okay. The uh, superintendent of the hospital was a doctor, and he lived on the grounds with his family. Yes. How, how could you be secure if they just had canvas covers? Uh, I mean, what protected you from people and animals? Oh, no, it wasn't just canvas. No, no see, they had put those windows. walls in. But this window. Oh, that was before. Right, but then they added the walls. They added the walls. They took out the canvas oh, and they added the walls. Yeah, so that, those are all, that's, those, those, are the those are the buildings. Those are the windows. But they put in all of this. Yeah. But initially that had been open to the air. Speak up. Was it Halloween party? Now, did you have, how come, were you all in the same building if you took that photograph? No. 
okay, so you weren't in that building. They kept you away right. from her. Okay. Where were the boys? They're here. They're there. Yes, the boys. Yeah. No, it has been separate. Separate quarters. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. yeah, because you have boys in the house. That was Easter. 1952. Yeah. That was me. Now, which one? Which one? Third? Third from, from the left. Third from the left. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. And the little girl in front on the right, she is uh, her brother with it. They were foster children. Mm -hmm. Her brother was there. Also. Somebody who sees this. Uh, I have confirmation in the back. They look young. They all look like communion. But it wasn't, they, were not, they all had their confirmation. Is it church? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. We went to confession in the church and everything. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a non denomination. It was a graduation. Yeah, that was that's me too, the second from the, from the left. And this is something I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Liberty Acres, yeah. but this is. Wait, what did you hear about it? I can't remember, but I know I've heard of it. Liberty I've Acres. Heard. Yeah. Yeah, no one seems to. Do, do you know? Liberty Acres. It's on Park Street West. It's down by Gordon Road. It's yeah. on Park yeah. Street. I got Park Street West. Across 28. Uh huh. What is now? Now we that was at least hold so many wine all that was called it. Now I'm wondering why I because obviously we walked. This was a place where we walked from the hospital. You you could get there if you went from down and back. And there was yeah. an old rickety bridge that you went over and around. Uh, really? And you'd end up at the, at the back of uh, Liberty Acres. Is that the bridge? Uh, well, I was reading my diary, and I, I, I haven't read it in so many years. And after this picture was taken, I wrote in here that we got in trouble for being at Liberty Acres. <laughs> <laughs> so we got some kind of punishment for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. The audience, the audience, the audience. Mm -hmm. But they just don't be outside, yeah, outside now, right? Not forming the wall. They're a real time capsule. That's why I know. It's amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing. What, what years were you there? I went there in, uh, I went there in, uh, in May of 1951. Mm -hmm. And I was there until 54. How old were you in 51? Uh, 51, I was 11. Okay. So, but it's, it's sad, but yet I think it was, it was a lot of people, <coughs> a lot of the, the kids that were there mm -hmm. felt a camaraderie, you know, because of the, they all <coughs> lost a mother, a lot of them lost a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, Somebody was sick and whatever, so we had kind of a unity, more or less, you know. And I just want to show you this picture of my mother because my mother was so beautiful and she died at 38 years old. Oh, oh, she was gorgeous. And you think, I remember thinking that 38 was older. <laughs> They do. There is, yeah, but not like not like years ago. How is it passed along from person to person? Did you have to have surgeries? No. No. Because my mother was in a TB sanatorium in Connecticut uh -huh. and had you know one whole lung removed and half the other one and sandbags on your chest for four years oh, no, no. and all that stuff. So. When I first went there, I was in that hospital area, the same floor that I was on, a little down the hall, there were so many babies there with meningitis. Do they remember anything about meningitis at this hospital? They had got meningitis. Did their mothers there? 
No, just the baby, just children, just the babies. Mm -hmm. Babies and, and small children, they all have cribs, anxiety cribs. And a lot of them die very bad. Mm -hmm. You can see the, you know, the crib would be empty in the morning in the hallway because they had to sterilize it and do whatever. Yeah. There was a lot of pharyngitis. Mm -hmm. My question is this. I live in Edgewood now. I moved here from out of state, and uh, it's very interesting. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, my question is, how come the community couldn't sustain the funds to have this hospital move forward, even if it was outside of TB, with all the other diseases that we're faced with now, you know, versus TB is not so prevalent. Yeah, like, I think you have to ask. I think this gentleman might be <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Edward. Okay. I'm sorry if it comes off as an inert question. I just, it's, I'm curious. I'm not sure that, I, I mean, I don't have an official capacity to speak to those things. I do work for state government. I have some familiarity with the campuses. There's a, we really look at the state's public hospitals and safety net systems mm -hmm. for people who cannot afford health care through traditional health care So um, I think as the state, the legislature, and subject matter experts review these things, they decide that um, the agencies that are supporting this, and this is developmental disabilities, had looked at their portfolio, and what is the public sector providing, what is private sector providing, and what are their needs. And cost-benefit analysis would say that it is probably makes sense to, to close a facility like this and consolidate it. Treatments change, treatment methodologies change, so now it's a better place or a more economic way to do it. So you couldn't necessarily switch from like a TB facility to like mental health? It did, did that. That's, yeah. that's really what they did back okay. in, I think, it was 60. Yeah, in, uh, but that still can sustain the business right here. Of the Department of Mental Health. Okay. Yeah. In okay. The, in, because you're not from around here, in the, in the 1980s, they closed most of the state mental health facilities. Yeah. Um, so Danvers State closed mm -hmm. and the Berry closed, and they, 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 they were approaching the... They didn't want to institutionalize people, so they were approaching mental health as an outpatient oh, okay. Okay. issue at the time, and so the buildings became obsolete. Mm -hmm. uh, if there was anyone else here that was a patient during that time, I looked at Dr. Jack. Does anyone else here patient? I spent three years there as a child. Oh. I was coming out just as she was going out. So I was there from 48 to 50. And I remember rhubarb, and I hated it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I remember those gastrics. The gastrics, yeah. And I was seven. Uh, yeah. They put a, a tube up your nose and you had to swallow it all. Oh, oh my God. I have that in my diaries. I got yeah, one like that I had a gastric, and it was a tough one. You know, yeah, and and sometimes they hurt, and sometimes yeah. they didn't. Yeah. And they say, just keep swallowing. Yeah, yeah. swallowing it. They you know, when you're five and six. <laughs> And that was from nutrition? Nutrition, nutrition. Yeah. So to check, I think, uh, the fluid yeah. in the stomach. From what? So that you're, to see if you were, if you were contagious, like the negative or the positive. You, know, you had to have, before you could go home, you had to have three negative gastrons. Oh, my God. How quickly did TV go down on after the story of the turning of what the cause was? Well, back in the, you see a big decline, like from 50% of the deaths to about 20% of the deaths by the early 1900s. But still, you know, it was, it was primarily transmitted, but through the air, bacteria that was unleashed from coughing, spitting, but it, you didn't even have to touch somebody to kiss them or anything like that. It, it could be let loose in the air. And that's why it was so difficult in, in the workplace. You know, if somebody had coughed on something and you touched it, you could get TV that way. You no, know, no, some of it could. So sometimes people were infected by drinking 
work from cows to the head of the And yeah, that could be one source, but it was just one source. It was primarily airborne, but until they started to realize it could also be transmitted through milk, a lot of people weren't necessarily struck by it. Yes. Am I incorrect in uh, stating that tuberculosis is on the increase? Slight. Just slight. Well, slight here. Yeah, but I've heard that in some places, I, I, Nigeria, they're worried about it. I mean, there are some places around, you know, uh, it's, it's bacteria. That's it. That's the big problem now. Yeah, there's a whole new uh, strain of it that they can't seem to be. So it is coming down. One of the things that you didn't really didn't touch on that I think it's not important with tuberculosis as much was that how beautiful the facility was. Um, the, just the flower gardens, the great, uh, and all the uh, vegetable trees, and, um, and how it was self sufficient with all the, well, they had a piggery and, a, and the cows and, a, and a, they raised Absolutely. all their food. You, you know. can see the piggery and everything else in the diagram. It's amazing. I know, but it's, uh, I had had some knowledge about the, uh, most of the state facilities were very similar. They, they had professional gardeners, they had flower beds, these were beautifully you know, maintained facilities. They had a, a goldfish pond with, with, in the middle of the flower beds. And, uh, yes, sir. Yes, I have a, a, kind of a general health care, uh, health care, uh, health care. Health question: In the um, was it before was it before or after the influenza epidemic of over the, by 1918 okay. that so many people started this idea of of either having built or enclosed or or semi enclosing a porch for a sleeping porch? Um, I know that uh, both in my in my own own family's history when my my both my parents came from Worcester. In both families, they, I think it was in the, in the, in the, in the, in the teens, that the number of, uh, they began sleeping on the sleeping porches outdoors, and when my mother said when there was snow on my blanket, she decided to come indoors. But my, 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 um, my father, his brother, and his father slept outdoors, I think, for, uh, on, on a, on a, on a semi-enclosed porch for one whole winter because they felt it was much more helpful. But they died in pneumonia. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. I just wanted to, um, I don't know, see my mother had TB in the, in the 40s and there was a huge stigma so that when the AIDS crisis happened in the 80s, I remember her telling me she knew exactly what people with AIDS felt like because at the time that she had it, they didn't know exactly how it was transmitted and, and uh, you know, regular people didn't know. The doctors had a better understanding to the point where she was in the sand for four years and when she got out, she didn't feel comfortable moving back to the little town in Connecticut where she'd grown up. She, she felt ostracized. People wouldn't invite her to their homes because they weren't sure that she was cured, you know. There was, some ignorance there. there was a lot of ignorance and a lot of stigma and a lot of fear. I wondered by the time, you know, a decade later, did you feel any of that? Well, let me tell you, I mean, I'm here tonight in front of all you people who are all strangers. You wouldn't tell anybody when my you were a kid. My friends don't even know about this. Yeah. Some of my family, my husband's family, they don't, they probably know, maybe not, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't told anyone. You feel a little funny, especially like if someone comes over and they have little children and whatever, you think, oh my God, you tell them on the TV, like 50 years ago or more. Yeah. You know, but they still, you, you always think of it as having like something really bad. Yeah, my, my, my mom finished four years, years of high school in a year so that she could move to Hartford where nobody knew her. You know, in hopes that you wouldn't have to tell anybody. But given that, that you have shared this with complete strangers, and that your closest people and your relatives don't know it about you, have you ever thought of publishing this? 
Oh, you have a diary. You have beautiful have facts and beautiful crazy. pictures. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think you have a crowd here that would buy this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I, I'm enthralled with it. I think it's fascinating. No, I didn't. I, uh, like, even my husband, I mean, you know, he knows, but he doesn't know. But he, I, he, yeah. He's not here yeah. tonight because I didn't tell him. <laughs> wow. He wanted to come. Wow. He said, Tom, let me know I want to come. And he plays cards on Tuesday night. He's going to be very upset when I go home. No, I'm serious. Well, Have you thought crazy. about that? Have you been approached by this? <laughs> think it by anyone? Well, no. Because I think. Do you, would you want to? Would you be interested? He can watch it on Norcam. I think it's fascinating. I think you should pursue this. Who thinks that? I think that. <laughs> Like, well, I have so many layers, there's so many more. Well, of course. Layers. Yeah. Layers. It gets better. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, but it's fascinating. I have it here, but, but it, was a, it was a Christmas gift. Oh, it's a beautiful my cousin, my cousin gave this to me as a Christmas gift. Wow. It's supposed to be a five-year diary, but I made it into a three-year diary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's amazing just reading, reading back, and, and some of the, some of the things that I read, it doesn't sound like my age. Like I sound, I write older than my age. And reading was such a big part of it too, because um, I'm just saying, I, I read and read and read, which I do now too. I read and read, but I can remember reading um, books that were way above what a 12-year-old would read, and I'm not talking required reading for school. I mean, I can remember reading. The Two cities and you know classic, uh, classic uh, books and um, it, it bothers me now stuff because I have grandkids that you feel less of a reader. You know, they, they're, they're all they have arthritis in their bones. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, they don't read pleasure. Oh, I have to read that. We did a John or Carrie, do you want to mention the website? Yeah, there are a few things on the back table. That you, there were uh, little sheets of the website. There's a a woman has a North Reading Sanitarium mm -hmm. website. Uh, and if you Google, the, it's really the first thing that comes up. The address is there. It's easy There's to find. Also, but a sign-up sheet. If there are people who have memorabilia or might be willing at some point to do oral history, things that they can share about. We were, we've been talking about trying to organize a day with the local historical society and scan photographs. Opinion take oral histories, do, do things like that. But if we knew what was out there, who would be interested in doing that? There is a sign-up sheet out there. And anything would be appreciated. I think this is an important part of the, the community's history that should be seen. Medical history, exactly. But, I mean, there are so many levels to this. The community, the state health care system, disease. You know, like, you know.